And now it's time to talk about the United States public lands and how we use these lands and what impact does that have on our society. And by U.S. public lands, I mean the land of the United States that's owned by you. There's land set aside and owned by the United States government that you can use for many different purposes. These are taxpayer-owned public lands managed by the United States government and certain agencies within the government. And that's what we're going to talk about today and what impacts do these lands have on us as a society. So remember the concept called the tragedy of the commons, which refers to areas that are owned by no one but used by everyone. The example that we used in class was the oceans, and the oceans, because they're owned by no one, but they're used by everyone, their fishing resources are being depleted. It's a shared common area that basically operates by first come, first served, and the resources are usually depleted. In the case of the ocean, we have overfishing. There's other examples out there. Our rangelands in the United States are being overgrazed. There's other examples like deforestation. The, you can even argue population growth on land. Um, we're using up non-renewable mineral resources. All right, so remember the tragedy of the common and keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this lecture on public lands. Because we have this problem in the United States as land is used for many purposes. And sometimes that's all at once and we need this balance. Our government tries to create balance in our public lands and try to make it work and try to make everybody happy while maintaining ecosystems and preserving cultural heritage and preserving land, but sometimes it doesn't work. So we need this balance and our government tries to make that happen. All right, another thing to keep in mind is something called maximum sustainable yield. In order to keep a population safe from destruction or being depleted, we must use this concept called maximum sustainable yield. What that's referring to is the maximum amount of a species that you can take away without hurting its population. That's the maximum sustainable yield. All right, How much of that population can you take away and still not hurt it? It's based on a mathematical formula. It comes out to be about if you look at this graph here, half of the carrying capacity is the maximum sustainable yield on average. So our maximum sustainable yield, mathematical formula, refers to the carrying capacity divided by two. All right, the number of population that you could take away without hurting the population. So that's another concept to keep in mind as we move through this lecture and we're also going to be working with this in class so try and take a note on this right now and we'll be using it later all right so let's take a look at the lands of the United States and how they're classified all right if you look here at this map it shows you the public lands set aside and owned by some agency of the government all right and all the colored little areas there are publicly owned land all right, the United States has about 42% of its land as public, which is more than any other nation in the world. Of that public land, the government is the single greatest landowner, which owns and manages about 600 million acres, or about 25% of our country. All right, if you notice here, most of our publicly owned land is in the west. I'm just going to draw this. All right, and Alaska. About 55% of all public lands are in the 11 most western states. And then you can think about 37% more of our public land is in Alaska. So about 92% of all public lands are in western states, which leaves about 8% of the lands in the east. So we see this different set of situations here where most of the land in the west is government owned. Two very different cultures are created here. So let's talk about who the government is that owns and manages all this land. All right, and here this is just another image, another visual to take a look at, and this shows you by percentage how much of the state is publicly owned. If you look at Pennsylvania, not that much, 2.5%, but in the case of Nevada, you're looking at almost 85% of the state of Nevada is publicly owned.
Take a look at the western states in Alaska. It's almost 70% of it is public land. All right, and then you got Oregon at 53% and so forth. All right, so who is the government that owns and manages all this land? It starts with the U.S. Department of the Interior, and they are the government entity that's in charge of all the lands. They oversee all the other government bureaus that involve public lands. Those other government bureaus are going to be the U.S. Forest Service. Okay, then we have the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the last one that we'll talk about here is the Bureau of Land Management, or the BLM. All right, those three government bureaus are all under the U.S. Department of the Interior, which is the one that oversees all public lands. So we're going to be talking about more or less these three entities as we move through this lecture, but I want you to know that it's the Department of the Interior that is the overseer. All right, and if you go to the U.S. Department of the Interior website, you see the general statement here, our mission is to protect and power our future. So right away, you should start thinking that the Department of the Interior, our government, is kind of torn between preservation and then exploiting those lands for public use. And powering our future, take a look here at the uh, right below this. The U.S. Department of the Interior protects America's natural resources and our heritage and culture, but it also supplies the energy to power our future. All right, so we're, we're torn in between protecting and conserving and preserving land and wildlife and biodiversity. We're torn between that and mining and drilling and exploiting our land for, for rangelands and grazing animals. So this is going to be a real interesting situation here to try and make everybody and everything happy. And that's what our government tries to do. All right, so let's take a quick look at some of those public lands that are managed by government bureaus. So let's start with the U.S. Forest Service and take a look at the United States forests that are public lands. And as you should notice, most of those public lands are in the west. And closest to us, the U.S. Forest Service manages the Allegheny National Forest, that small little bit in northwestern Pennsylvania, but is important for so many reasons. It's one of the bigger publicly owned forests on the East Coast. Uh, there's actually a dark sky preserve there where you can go and use that area to observe the night sky. If you think about the night sky as a natural resource, that's being preserved in the Allegheny National Forest, along with other things. But these are the U.S. Forest Service lands just so that you're aware. All right, taking a look here, moving right along. We have the Fish and Wildlife Service and the lands that they own and manage. The Fish and Wildlife Service owns and manages lands called Wildlife Refuge. And just so you're aware, these are places that basically preserve wildlife uh, habitats, wildlife migration areas, things like that. And then the third one is the Bureau of Land Management, and they take care of most of the nation's rangelands. So sticking with our theme here, most of those rangelands are out west and in Alaska, but the Bureau of Land Management becomes one of the more controversial government entities, and we're going to talk about that as we move through this lecture. But before we get to rangelands, let's talk about the categories that we use to classify our public lands. The first one is called multiple use. All right, multiple use land means that land is used for many different purposes at the same time. For example, you might have a forest that's used to protect a certain animal's habitat. But at the same time, you allow a company to come in and log the timber that's on that property. So you're torn between two different uses, conservation and logging. All right, that would be a nice example of a multiple use property. Um, so you can take all the resources or use that land but at the same time use it for a different purpose. A lot of times these purposes clash and they become uh, very controversial. So it becomes difficult to maintain a balance when you're dealing with a multiple use property. Second classification of land use is called moderately restricted. Moderately restricted land is a little bit different we can use it and you can go on it but it operates under the principle of conservation 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put restrictions on this property to kind of avoid those conflicts of use under a multiple use classification. All right, so this might be a resource that has intrinsic value. Maybe it's a forest that is allowed to be logged, but you're only allowing uh, certain trees to, to be logged. All right, that would be an example of moderately restricted because we want to maintain the biodiversity on that property, property and make sure that uh, the biodiversity isn't destroyed. A third classification is called restricted use. Now, restricted use operates under the idea of not conservation, but operates under the idea of preservation, which is much different. When we preserve something, we're basically saying, don't touch. All right, so restricted uses properties are typically very scenic, unique, maybe historic or cultural. They're basically labeled as too important to touch. So restricted use you might be able to go on it, but there's tremendous amounts of restrictions on that property. A lot of times you cannot build roads, so we limit the amount of human influence on that property. All right? That's a restricted use. So keep these three types of land use categories in your mind as we go through here because U.S. public lands fall under one of these land use categories, and they're all different. Which brings us to our first land use that we'll talk about, the rangelands. Okay, rangelands are managed by the Bureau of Land Management, BLM. And the Bureau of Land Management instantly has a conflict between farmers using this land for grazing and the government trying to preserve land so that grazing can occur for years and years. We need the, these lands to be sustainable. Right, they're public lands. Farmers or ranchers will come and lease the land from the federal government, pay a price to use that land, but we have to make sure that those ranchers don't overgraze the property or there won't be money to be made, there won't be use and product for future generations. All right, so the Bureau of Land Management has this conflict where they have to service the public by preserving this land, but they also have to provide service to the farmer by allowing them on it. So they become more or less like a policing agency to make sure that things are going properly. All right, they put a lot of regulations on how much the farmers can use the land. All right, rangelands are grasslands. They don't get as much rain as a forest, so they become delicate. They're susceptible to fires and other disturbances. If you overuse the rangeland, you can lose biodiversity you lose the value of the land. All right? And this being public land, we don't want that to happen. One of the major accomplishments of the Bureau of Land Management was a law that occurred in 1934 called the Taylor Grazing Act. All right, this law allows for the first time the Bureau of Land Management a means by which the government can come in and slow down grazing on public lands. So this becomes the vehicle for preservation or conservation of these this type of US public land. So now, through the Taylor Grazing Act, ranchers need a permit. So we've turned um, uh, commons, these rangelands, where everybody was using but nobody owned, turned a common into a permit based system. All right, so now we can regulate, now we can go in and make sure that these properties are, are properly used. All right, so. A farmer would need to come in and get a permit. They'll have to get a permit from the Bureau of Land Management and they would have to explain how many animals that they're going to have for a certain amount of time. So let's take a look at a few pictures. Here you have a border between land that is being managed properly by the Bureau of Land Management and land that is being overgrazed or mismanaged. Here's just another picture. On the left you have overgrazed on the right you have grassland that still has the grass and is being managed properly. Okay, just another picture. So the Bureau of Land Management is one of those controversial government entities because of this conflict between the farmers and the land. And they have some odd policies. All right, they have to make sure that these rain 
the rangeland managers are protecting and restoring habitats when those are lost. Uh, they make sure that the, the rangeland ranchers are preserving nutrient cycles, all right, like the nitrogen cycle. They have to make sure that the ranchers are keeping the land in good condition all right, for future generations. So the Bureau of Land Management uh, is mostly political. All right, it's done by politicians, which is also a controversy. But I should mention that the Bureau of Land Management, they don't require the services of not one environmental scientist. So that's just an interesting fact. All right, so let's take a look at another type of land to manage in our U.S. public lands, the national parks. All right, and it's the National Park Service that manages our national parks. These are considered multiple use properties. All right, so they're used for many uses. We see value, but we also need these to be places for people to go. So again, we're kind of torn between the needs of the people, the tourists who want to go visit these places, and preserving our national parks. All right, the ecosystems and the biodiversity. Many times these places are ecologically sensitive and aesthetically beautiful, but we want people to go out and enjoy these places. So let's take a look at the map of national parks. Many are so small that they don't even show up on this map. Some of the bigger ones you might recognize like Yellowstone National Park and Yosemite. You might recognize uh, in Florida the Everglades. Okay, there's a bunch in Alaska. Take a look at Pennsylvania. Can you brainstorm and think of the nearest national park to us? And I'll put a little red dot there to represent, did you get it? Valley Forge National Park. All right, so the Grand Canyon is another one. Not too many national parks, but there are actually a lot of them. They're just so small that they don't show up on this map. Oops. All right, this national park, maybe some of you visited it. It's the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. It's an igneous uh, intrusion. It's called a lacolith. This was literally the volcanic neck of a volcano. All right, this is where the, the lava would go up. So the volcano was here and has since been eroded away. And all that's left is the igneous rock of the neck of the volcano, which would flow up and out, and then there was eruptions. So this is kind of evidence that there was volcanic eruptions and volcanoes in the Midwest. The Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And you have Mount Rushmore. Okay, very aesthetically beautiful, cultural heritage. You can Mount Rainier National Park. All right, and then there's Valley Forge, the one that's closest to us. All these places show our beauty. They're all unique ecosystems. We're preserving historical and cultural heritage. I particularly like this one. This is the Dry Tortuga National Park uh, that near the Florida Keys at the southern tip of Florida. And I think it's interesting that this is a national park and it's multiple use. So you can actually go here and visit it. And you can also camp here. So you can literally pitch a tent right in the middle of this fort and enjoy yourself by camping out on this national park. Okay, but there's a lot of problems with our national park. And the National Park Service is having trouble maintaining these parks. And one of the reasons is that no park exists in isolation. All right, there's interactions with all the properties around it. Often the land on the outside affects the inside of the park. So development becomes an issue. All right, Development is moving in on the borders which puts the pressure especially on the ecosystems of parks. All right, another problem that we're seeing is invasive species. Because of the development around a park invasive species can move in. Uh, there's a bunch of examples of this happening in the Everglades. A pet Burmese python uh, was released in the Everglades. Someone had it as a pet and didn't want it anymore. And now the Burmese python is invading the Everglades and changing the food chain and the trophic levels of the ecosystem of the Everglades. All right, 
invasive species are usually plants. There are over 6,500 non-native invasive species in our parks, and 70% of those are plants. All right, so our parks are really feeling the pressure of invasive species. Third issue is climate change. All right, so for example, uh, Glacier National Park can literally disappear from climate change. So that's an example of a national park that's really feeling pressure from climate change. Fourth problem is air and water issues. All right, we're talking about pollution, but we're also talking about water being drained out of national parks. They're getting drier. So, for example, the Colorado River Basin, water continuously is diverted away from the Colorado River for agriculture, for cities, and the Colorado River Basin is becoming drier. Uh, another example is, again, the Everglades, where a shortage of fresh water is being reported in the Everglades, which is a swamp and a marsh. So that water is being drained because of the demand in cities, in nearby cities. So the Everglades and the, and the Colorado River Basin are two examples of national parks that are that are experiencing water issues and a fifth example of a problem in national parks is us we are loving our national parks to death we're seeing an increased amount of tourists visitors some parks are overcrowded they are usually underfunded and they have a real hard time of balancing the people and the experience so an example would be the Grand Canyon is seeing a tremendous amount of people every year. Yellowstone National Park, we're trying to maintain the biodiversity and the natural feel, but it's hard when there's such overcrowding. All right. And one of the major issues with tourism are places where off-road vehicles are now being allowed. So certain desert biomes that, are, that include our national parks, like Joshua Tree National Park in California. Uh, the impact from ATVs and snowmobiles and other off-road vehicles are causing noise pollution. They're destroying habitats. We love to use these places, but when we do, we have a huge negative impact. So National Parks and the National Park Service is all dedicated to working on preserving the experience and the ecosystems of these places and balancing that with having people come and visit these places. All right, here's an example. This is the giant redwood forest, and you have visitors here uh, stopping on a roadside to take a picture with these big, giant, thousand-year-old trees. Now, think about this situation. We have come in and paved the road right next to these gigantic trees. Thousands and thousands of people come to stop here and take pictures. And what are they doing when they get out of their cars and they step on the soils here right next to these trees? What's going to happen? They're going to compact the soil. All right, so not only does our paved surface hinder the amount of water that can get to these tree roots, but now from too many people, the soil gets compacted and the trees literally die from a lack of water. It might rain there, but none of the water can get to the roots of the trees where it needs to get to. So it's interesting that us visitors can literally kill these thousand-year-old trees by standing next to them and taking their pictures. And this tree is an example of one that died and fell over, and I just love this picture. With that being said, let's move on to a third type of U.S. public land, the National Wildlife Refuges. These are places that are set aside for the primary purpose to protect wildlife. These are not multiple use. These are used for conservation. So these are moderately restricted use. All right, they're restricted, so it provides a place for wildlife to be protected. Where are they? Take a look at this map. All right, if you notice, most of these wildlife refuges are right along coastlines. Okay, take a look here. The coast of Florida. All right, 
and then you also see a big string of them right up through here and then you see a cluster right in the north central part of our continent if you stand back and take a look at this you notice that most of these refuges are along waterways so wetlands are the places that scientists determined are valuable so we need to protect them for wildlife and then you also see this huge number here in the central part of our continent all right these are migratory routes for specific animals these animals that use these refuges are ones that typically become endangered because we need to protect many habitats all right a lot of these things migrate to specific different places around the country most of which are wetlands so we have to protect many different places so that's why these animals become endangered because it's hard to protect these places so national wildlife refuges become very important places and if I race here I'll show you the two that are closest by us save actually did a, a cleanup here at this one this was the Edwin Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge and when we were down there last year we were doing a camping trip we did a cleanup because Hurricane Sandy had brought in a lot of trash and plastics and bags <clears throat> and things that were hurting the ecosystem down there so we scoured the swamps and the marshes of the Edwin Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge and cleaned up trash um, it's a nice experience and then this one here is the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge and that one is kinda interesting because it's a wetland it's right at the end of the runway at the Philadelphia Airport so this is a major migratory stop for a certain species that needs to be protected so those are just two of the many National Wildlife Refuges managed by the United States government around the country most of which are migratory routes these are all under the idea of moderately restricted so you can go on them you can even drive on them but they're set aside for conservation of habitat the Edwin Forsyth when we were down there we were able to drive on it but that was about it you had to leave at night you couldn't you couldn't take any off-road vehicles you had to stay on paths they're under the idea of moderately restricted so take a look at the top there you have a wetland all right and it's obviously a migratory pattern migratory stop for this specific bird and then on the bottom you have a migratory area for the caribou and this one in particular is called Anwar the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and in this course we'll be talking about Anwar a lot I'm sorry it's the Alaskan National Wildlife refuge this one becomes an important controversial topic because the whole question is do we open up this wildlife refuge all right restricted use should we open that up to oil drilling or should we continue to keep it for protection for wildlife so that one is hotly debated and we'll talk about that one in our energy unit all right so that brings us to our last type of US public land we'll talk about in this lecture wilderness areas so within wildlife refuge are wilderness areas and these are an example of something that's set aside for one reason to protect the land this is total preservation restricted use All right, so this is our example of restricted use public land you're not allowed motor vehicles you may or may not be able to hike or camp these are set aside for one reason to protect in the 1990s there was a law passed and it was dubbed the the roadless rule this law went ahead and disallowed the building of roads all right, those wilderness lands who adopted the roadless rule think about it when if there is no road that really limits human use so this is an effort to try and protect large areas of completely intact and completely valuable landscapes so there's no mining no building logging is off limits you might be able to hike 
and maybe you can fly over in an airplane. All right. There's not too many of these designated, but the ones that are are set aside for total preservation for future generations. And if you look here at the map in the top, that's percentage of areas designated as wilderness. Not too many. All right. Most of the ones that are designated are out west or in Alaska. But here on the East Coast, it's relatively unknown to have wilderness. All right, but it's important to keep this set aside for future generations. Okay, so with a couple of final notes here, um, just kind of realize that there's lots of land set aside for multiple use, but it's public land, and the Bureau of Land Management and the Department of the Interior has control over it. They try and balance human needs with natural needs by setting aside land for a series of different purposes. These lands, through their designation, gives us a concept of how we want to manage that land. Multiple use, moderately restricted use, and restricted use. All right, now those multiple use properties. Looking at the Bureau of Land Management, and this is their home page, and take a look here at the circled area, what we do. All right, we already know they're trying to preserve and balance human needs with natural needs, but look at the human needs. They're trying to balance our need for energy, grazing, all right, recreation, and more. It, it's, it's a struggle to balance those things and care for the ecosystems at the same time, especially when our demand for energy means things like mining and taking our public lands and opening up open pit mines. We'll be talking about this in class, but think about the tremendous destruction the negative environmental impacts of an open pit mine which is happening on our public lands. Here's a newspaper article I found from 2011 coal mining to expand on public lands in Wyoming. People are up in arms, environmentalists are up in arms because they're expanding the types of mining and the amount of coal mining in particular on public lands. All right, the federal government is making more land available for lease by mining companies. Just like our forests and the timber industry, think about what that does for the American public. By leasing lands and allowing royalties to these companies and subsidizing the coal companies, we're keeping the price of energy down. We're keeping coal available. Another issue right now in the news is fracking and making natural gas deposits open for lease and the place that it's going on right now is the Appalachian Basin but as you should now know not too many public lands are available in Appalachia so natural gas companies are asking private property owners to lease their land but here is where public lands are being utilized by natural gas companies to frack and extract natural gas deposits so the question is should we allow companies to exploit those resources on our public lands? That becomes the question. And we'll be debating this and talking about it in class, but just to kind of get some things in your mind, fracking is all right if it's done properly, but there could be problems. Here's an example in the summer of 2012 in Colorado. Um, fracking fluid was being stored on the surface and in, on public lands, and there was heavy rains, and it came in and flooded those those surface ponds and all the fracking fluid uh, basically leaked off into uh, water supplies. So fracking fluid from these companies who were exploiting natural gas on public lands, um, it became a big disaster. All right, you saw this at the beginning of our course, and now that you know some of these governing bodies, like the Department of the Interior, right here, thinking about their budget and thinking about the land that they have to manage, take a look at this, just realize how little of the money that they're budgeted on a yearly basis. This is a hundred million dollars. This is eight hundred million. Think about their budget and all the public land that they have to manage and that's the budget of the Department of the Interior who then divvies that money out to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, to the US Forest Service, to the Bureau of Land Management, all right, that's what we're working with here, just to keep things in perspective.
let's wrap up this talk and consider some of the laws that have been passed that help manage and govern our public lands. The National Environmental Policy Act is a big one. Shortened to NEPA, NEPA is a law that requires any developer that's going to utilize a United States public land, they have to put together a report called an EIS, an Environmental Impact Statement. So a developer must put together this report and it must detail all the predicted and known environmental impacts to the site. And then also uh, any, any alternatives. It must provide a detail of any alternatives. Okay, so looking at this, this report must be given to the federal government and then the government decides if the proposal will be accepted. A lot of times uh, the developer will be required to submit an environmental litigation plan talking about how they will address the project's environmental impact so they have to come up with solutions and they'll find out. So let's, let's say a company is, I don't know, proposing to destroy a wetland and that wetland has on it, it's a habitat for an endangered species, a turtle. All right, so the company won't really know that until they do the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, and, and basically find out that the turtle is there. They'll recognize that this is a problem, and then they'll have to come up with a solution. So they'll find out through their EIS what the impacts are, and then they have to detail what they'll do for a solution, and that's called an Environmental Mitigation Plan. This is how things work. All right, and that's an environmental Im mitigation plan. So how are you going to address the impacts? They have to come up with solutions. So in the case of our destruction of a wetland and there's an endangered species of turtle on it, maybe they their solution is to create a wetland nearby. So where they're destroying a wetland, they're actually creating one, and that's going to be the solution uh, for destroying this habitat. So basically what the company is saying is there will be impacts, and there are always impacts when it comes to developing land, when it comes to land manipulation, there will be impacts. This EIS, this Environmental Impact Statement, will outline those predicted and known impacts. It'll suggest alternatives, and they'll also come up with solutions in an environmental mitigation plan. So this is what companies do, and this is what the federal government accepts as a procedure and a process to either grant access or limit access onto United States public lands. So NEPA becomes a weapon by the federal government to understand what's going to happen to the environment and either allow it with solutions and a mitigation plan or to restrict it. Okay, So that's a little bit about United States public lands and how they're classified and who the government is and how they manage our lands and what lands we're talking about. This is some of the problems that come with managing public lands and here you go with NEPA and the National Environmental Policy Act and how we understand the impacts that companies are going to make when they're using our public lands. So if you have any questions bring them to class. You're a little bit more learned as you always are when you listen and take notes on these lectures for the AP Environmental Science Classroom. Thanks.